Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody in this afternoon again and back from your coffee break. And once again, we just want to welcome our television audience wherever you are. Uh, it's so thrilling to get our mail, I think, from every state in the Union now, as well as various places around the world, because it's just amazing how the Internet, for one thing, covers all the world. And uh, now we were just told in Branson the other day that we're on a European system that I didn't even know we were on. We're not paying for it, but it covers a hundred million households. And uh, so pray for that. Uh, you will just trust will fill up the body and uh, we can be out of here. All right, let's get back to where we left off in our last half hour. We just got started in chapter five in case somebody out there missed it. And we've now uh, gone beyond King Nebuchadnezzar. He's faded off the scene. He goes into the dustbin of history. His son took over in the meantime by the name of Nabonidus. Now even at break time a lot of you were asking me what the guy's name was and I hope you can all catch it. N-A-B-O-N-I-D-U-S. Nabonidus. And he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. But now in chapter 5 we're already into the next generation. Time keeps going, you know. And uh, Belshazzar then is the son of Nabonidus or he's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. All right, that's history. Now, I know a lot of people don't like history, but if you're going to appreciate this book, you better learn to love history, because this is what it is. It's God's story, see? And uh, he's the one that's in total control. All right, now then, we were introduced in chapter 5, in the first four verses in our last program, of this King Belshazzar, who is blaspheming, in my word, the utensils that they brought back from Jerusalem that they literally absconded from the temple. But at least Nebuchadnezzar and his son did not commit the blasphemy of using those holy vessels of silver and gold for their drunken banquets, but Belshazzar does, and he's going to pay royally for doing so. All right, so he brings out all the vessels that had been brought from Jerusalem and uses them in their drunken banqueting. Verse 4, they drank wine and praised the gods, the pagan gods, which were made of gold and silver. There's two products. And of brass and iron, there's four. And of wood and stone, six. And as I mentioned in the closing remarks, six is the number of man. And so this was something that was totally absent of anything of God's power. All right, now then verse 5, you've all heard the story of the handwriting on the wall, and uh, this is how it all came about. We're going to take it verse by verse, otherwise you miss something. In the same hour, while they're banqueting, there came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. That's all that was visible was the part of a man's hand. Verse 6, the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. Honey, do you remember? <laughs> The one and only time that she got up to do something in public, she was glad she was behind something because she said her knees were knocking. <laughs> and uh, you've probably all experienced it because, you know, polls have been taken. Really, what is the most frightening thing that people can think could happen to speak to a public audience. Well, when I was looking at this, I didn't say anything to her until now, but she had an experience and she said, never again. But her knees knocked, see? And she said, you didn't hear them? <laughs> no. <laughs> but see, this is nothing new. This is way back in antiquity. You didn't know that, did you, honey? <laughs> Even old Belshazzar's knees were knocking, see? All right, verse 7. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers 
the Chaldeans. Now remember, we covered all that in chapter 1. These were all segments of the magicians and soothsayers, but they had their rank, see? And the Chaldeans, of course, were supposedly the most intelligent and uh, the most gifted of all these others. And the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon. Now you've got to remember that these pagans did not depend on anything of the God of Scripture. All they knew were the pagan gods and goddesses of all the way back to the Tower of Babel. See, that's when they really began. All right, so uh, he says to these wise men, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men. Now, I hope you've got enough imagination to, to just picture all this, how that all these astrologers and these soothsayers and these guys that were drawing on demonic power are now coming together to try to interpret this handwriting on the wall. But they could not, verse 8, nor could they make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled. His countenance was chained. In other words, he starts to show his worry. And his lords, his underlings, were astonished. Verse 10, now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in the kingdom. Now, stop and think. When something like this happened, what should have been the first person that would come to Belshazzar's mind? Well, Daniel. These people were human. They knew what had been taking place in the past. Don't think that they didn't talk about things and discuss things like we would. Don't you suppose old Nebuchadnezzar shared with his son and maybe even this son how Daniel had interpreted his dream and uh, how the three son or the three little Hebrew boys were cast into the fiery furnace and never got touched? That was all rehearsed. They knew that. And yet, see, the last thing they think of is anything that pertains to the God of heaven. All right, but the queen evidently did, see? And uh, so she said, there is a man in the kingdom in whom is the spirit. Now it's in verse 11. In whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Now you see how deep that paganism goes? That even though Daniel had proved over and over and the, the other three young Hebrew lads how that the God of Israel was superior over all the pagan gods, and yet they try to connect it, if anything, to their own gods, see? All right, so, verse 11 again. There is a man in the kingdom whom the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, grandfather, again, we're going back to Nebuchadnezzar, and in the days of thy grandfather, light and understanding wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, small g, they're pagan gods. And the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy grandfather, the king, I say, thy grandfather, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and Susan. In other words, Daniel just put them to shame with his God-given wisdom, see? Now verse 12. <clears throat> For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and the dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. So Daniel is brought in before the king, verse 13. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, who art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my grandfather brought out of Jewry or out of Jerusalem? I have heard of thee. Well, I would think so, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. But see, who is he leaving out? 
the true God of Israel, the Most High. They're still leaning on the gods of paganism. I mean, it's just unbelievable, and yet it isn't. We're no different today. The world is no different today. All right? Verse 15. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But they could not show the interpretation of the thing. I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretation, dissolve doubts. Now if thou can read the writing, make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold, same thing as he said before to the, to the uh, Babylonians. And thou shalt be third ruler of the kingdom. Now Daniel comes forth. Now, how old is he? Have you been keeping track? He's up in his 60s, maybe even 70s. Remember, he was 12 when they took him from Jerusalem to Babylon. But see, Daniel has stayed in the high echelons of the Babylonian government all through Nebuchadnezzar's rule, all through Nabonidus' rule, and he's still there with the third one now, Belshazzar. And then, if you want to see something interesting, let's just jump all the way over. I hope I can find it. In chapter 10, now this is just to whet your appetite. In chapter 10, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus. Now that's the king of the next empire. See? And in the third year of King Cyrus of the Mede and Persian Empire was revealed unto who? Daniel. <laughs> well, I figured it up the other night. He is now 80-some years old, which makes sense because how long was the captivity? 70 years. Well, we know he lived beyond the captivity. How old was he when he went down? 12 or 14. So 12 plus 70 in my arithmetic is 82, but he's already going on into the Medan Persian Empire, and from what I gather, he probably lived to about 93 or 94 years of age, which in antiquity was quite a while, see? Okay, so anyway, coming back to chapter 5 again. So Daniel is coming along in years. He's certainly not up at the end of it anywhere, but uh, he's probably in his late 60s or 70s. And uh, verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself. You can have your gold and your silver because you're not going to be around to give it to me anyway. See? <laughs> kind of, kind of a, a clue right here. Let thy gifts be to thyself. Give thy rewards to another. <clears throat> Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known the interpretation. Verse 18. Here it comes. O thou king. The Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, thy grandfather, a kingdom, majesty, glory, honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, that is for the then known world, remember, which is only that area out in the Middle East and up to the Mediterranean. And uh, that was about it at that time. All right. And... Uh, for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Because don't forget now that head of gold was absolute. Whom he would, he slew. Whom he would, he kept alive. He was absolute in his power. Whom he would, he would set up. And whom he would, he'd put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne. They took his glory from him, and he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts. His dwelling was with the wild asses, that is, the wild animals of the forest. They fed him with grass like oxen. Now, I've got to stop a minute. Do you think old Belshazzar knew that? Well, he's sure he would have. Seven years of grandpa out there? In the woods with animals? Well, of course he knew. Well, what's Daniel doing? I think Daniel is just pushing the dagger into the very spiritual heart of this wicked king. And he's just reminding him of the power of 
Daniel's God. See? All right. Verse 22. And thou his grandson. Now I'm making the correction as we go. I trust you're seeing that. And thou his grandson, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thy heart, though you knew all this. See? They knew it. They knew what kind of a God they were dealing with in reality. But I can't help it. Are men any different today? Not one whit. They have no concept of the power of the God of this book. I doubt if there's hardly anybody in Washington anymore that has a true understanding of the God of this book. Oh, they may give him some kind of a reference, but to really know that he's in control, I have to doubt it. All right, and so it was no different back here in uh, 500 and some B.C. But thou, verse 23, but thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house, that is the temple, before thee. And thou and thy lords and thy wives, thy concubines, have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone, all those pagan, worthless gods of idols. And you know that they see not, they hear not, they don't know anything. And the true God, capital G, the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose, in other words, who owns all thy ways, you have not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. Now here's the part I know you all know. This everybody, I think, realizes. And now Daniel can just come down on him with all the force of the God of glory. This is the writing that was written. Many Meaning, tekel up harson. And this is the interpretation. Meaning, God hath numbered thy kingdom. But how many times is the word spoken? Twice. See? Emphasis. That's what you've got to look for in Scripture. That wasn't an accident. God is emphasizing that very statement. God has numbered your kingdom. God has numbered your kingdom. And what did he find? And finished it. See? Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Now, I've read some time back that antiquity, almost the heart of their world was the balances. Everything was established by balances, whether it was trade or buying commodities and everything, it was all on the basis of the balances. You know how they are. All right, and so when God used that as an illustration, that he and his behavior and his absolute rejecting the God of Daniel, the balances were completely against him. All right, you've been weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Belshazzar, you don't stand a chance. Now, it's rather interesting that Daniel makes no effort to help this man spiritually. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he did. But this man, he makes no indication. All he's giving him is his judgment, which, of course, will fall before the next morning. All right? So many, many. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Belshazzar, you've had it. It's over. You've been weighed in the balances, and you don't measure up. And Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, I don't know if you know history well enough. I hope you do. While they were sitting in this huge banquet hall, there in ancient Babylon, which, of course, the Euphrates River flew right, flowed, not flew, flowed right through the center of the city. 
And so unbeknown to the Babylonians, what had the Medes and Persians done? They had diverted the waterway so that the Euphrates going under the wall dried up. And they walked in on dry ground and just completely surprised the Babylonians, and they were defeated before sunrise. Okay, now that's the history, see? All right, the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians, which were indicated by the silver of Nebuchadnezzar's image back there in chapter 2. All right, so verse 29. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night, not the next one, that same night, and that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. And Darius, the next emperor of the combination of the Medes and the Persians. Now you see that whole Middle East is so closely connected. See, the Medes and the Persians were just off to the northeast of Babylon, and a lot of their government people were intermarried. They were cousins and so forth. So this was all pretty much a family thing, really. And so when Darius the Mede took the kingdom, he was 62 years old. All right, now then, Daniel moves right on from this Babylonian palace over to the palace of the Medes and the Persians, and he continues to be a high government official even in the next empire. And so now we come into chapter 6, and uh, we're going to now be dealing primarily with this next kingdom, the Medes and the Persians, because it's this kingdom that will now give the Jews permission to go back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, but it'll not be under Darius, it will be under Cyrus. And uh, like I've already shown you, by the time Cyrus becomes the king, Daniel will be up in his 80s and on up into his 90s before he evidently passed off the scene. Okay, so let's just keep moving verse by verse because there's no chapter breaks in the original. <clears throat> so chapter 6, verse 1. The Medes and the Persians are now the ruling empire with the capital over in Shushan. So it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over, or they will rule as authority over the whole Mede and Persian empire, which would cover that whole part of the Euphrates Valley and all the way on over to Israel and uh, even down into Egypt. All right, over these would rule three presidents, of whom Daniel was first. Now, you see, this is amazing. I mean, this is, again, the miracle working of God, that here this little fellow Daniel, kidnapped, really, at the age of 12, taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, and becomes, from almost the age of 15, a ruling entity throughout the Babylonian Empire and just moves on over 100 miles or so to the next capital of the next empire in Shushan. Just unbelievable. And becomes a, a leader of the empire. All right? So Daniel is the first of the three presidents who gave a count, of course, to the 120. Now, what are you seeing governmentally? Well, you see, Nebuchadnezzar didn't report to anybody. He did not have a Congress. He did not have a cabinet. If he needed help, he called in the astrologers and so forth, but he had no political organization to whom he reported. All right, now, you see, by the time we get to the next empire, the Medes and the Persians, you remember when we described the image? The head of gold was totally a singular head. Then we come to the Medes and Persians, it's down to two. But even the two heads of the Persian Empire now have these 120 princes to whom they would report, and then the three presidents had to report to the 120. So what have you got? Well, you've got the beginning of republic or democracy type of government. It's no longer an absolute 
monarch. Remember, that was the whole idea of Nebuchadnezzar's image of gold and silver and so forth. All right, so then verse 3, Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit, in other words, the spirit of the God of Israel was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Daniel is coming close to being the king of the whole Mede and Persian empire. Verse 4, a couple minutes left, and we're out of this one already. This Daniel was preferred above the president's princes because an excellent spirit was in him. The king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. What was their number one reason? He's a Jew. See, that's what the Gentile world can't handle. A Jew in our Gentile empire with this kind of power, it just ate at him like a cancer, see? All right? So they tried to find occasion against him because they could see that since God's power was within him and directing him, they could not find fault for as much as he was faithful, neither was any error or fault found in him. In other words, he had no scandal. He had no dishonesty. He was what a political leader should be. Verse 5. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now here comes the satanic powers again trying to pin Daniel to the wall with regard to his worship of the true God. Verse 6. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus, King Darius, live forever. That was an oriental greeting that was pretty much used commonly. Live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, princes, counselors, captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, except of thee, shall be cast into the lion's den. What are they doing? They're setting him up. You've heard of conspiracies, haven't you? Well, this is a total conspiracy in order to trap Daniel. And the main reason was their jealousy because he was a good Jew. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.